Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Jack and Joe show. And well, top of the table clash, well, second v third, and we come out on top 3 0 winners. Jack, how are you doing? Yeah, really well. Really good weekend. Um, despite the win, it was a difficult weekend with train strikes. Yes. Uh, and, and just cancellations. But the win basically got me through the weekend, which is great. How about you? Yeah, great. It's, it's one of those things, isn't it? The early kickoff, I guess, similar to a Friday night, I definitely felt it against Coventry. If you win, the weekend's great. You're in such a good mood. If you lose, obviously, it's just a bit of a downer, especially as everyone else plays and you've sort of got that hanging over you. But a great feeling. It was probably our biggest game of the season so far. And I would probably say, even though we played very well, not our most vintage performance again. Um, the fact that we were in second gear and we've come out 3-0 winners, I think is a very good sign. So what did you make of the performance, Jack? I feel this, is, this, this game was more about how we managed it than how we played. Yeah. Uh, and, and what I found very good from us was the fact that West Brom only had about two spells where they looked like they could have scored. And that was just after the first goal where Matt Clark had a header saved and they had a couple of chances with Bartley and um, Grant. And then and then after, straight after half-time where they kind of flew out the blocks and created a couple of chances. But even then, Rodak was tested, what, twice or three times? I think they had three shots on target. So I was very impressed with the way in which, and I'm sure we'll get on to Mitrovic in a second, how we managed the game, stifled West Brom, pressed them and forced them into mistakes, forced them into getting a red card with our balls over the top and the third goal just playing very, very well and, and capitalising. And, and what's impressing me the most about Fulham is I'm expecting fireworks every week, but really what you're seeing is not a massive performance of quality or there is, there is quality within those performances. It's just being very mature and we're, we're going about this championship season in a way in which, and I've compared it to us to Brighton before under Chris Hewton, very much like that, where they're not sensational. They're not like, this is the best team in the championship, but they're very much like, we're just getting the job done and whatever battle we've got to face this week, we'll get through it somehow. That's four wins in a row now, Joe, and I'm sure you're delighted. Yeah, completely. And I, th I think you're right. And it's a very, like almost like, business-like way we're going about the wins. The score lines are very a very high, like 4-0, 3-0, 4-1 against QPR. Mm. Obviously quite a simple 2-0 win against Cardiff in between. Um, and the performances themselves have been quite routine. Um, and I do want to touch on West Brom because West Brom coming into this game and even after it, they're our current closest competitors for the top two other than ourselves and Bournemouth. Mm. Um, we've obviously got Coventry up there as well, a few others that are slightly below. But West Brom, it's almost been billed as a top three, as if two of the three teams, us, Bournemouth and them, will get top two. And I've got to say, if they play like that and they keep this style of football, and it's a big if, I don't think they come close. The team they've got is good enough to get top two. The style of play, I don't think, gets the best out of their players. I thought the only time I was worried, and my dad said this as well, was at the very start of the second half when Townsend put the ball across the face of goal after quite a nice move when they actually tried to play football rather than just lumping it into the box and playing off set plays and etc. It's fine to do that. I completely appreciate that. But I think when you've got a team that good, you shouldn't be using that as your main source of goals. You should be trying to play through teams. And I think if they did that, they'd have probably caused us quite a few more problems. So from West, Point, West Brom point of view, I was relieved but disappointed with what I saw from them. I wasn't impressed. And I think if that's the best that the Championship got to offer this season, then anything other than top two, we've said it before, is a failure, but a complete and utter disaster because I was not impressed. Um, I was very impressed with the way we dealt with the physicality. Mm -hmm. Same as the Cardiff game. Um, you know, big striker in Hugh Gill, who has caused us problems in the past. I remember him scoring against us for QPR. I remember him causing us many problems when he was a Preston player quite a few years ago, around 2016 to 2018 sort of time. Um, but I was very impressed. And I think our defensive qualities have come through these last few weeks. Even the QPR game, we defended very soundly other than the goal. So that's four good defensive performances in a row. 
obviously Tosin's red card almost throws that into the mix. I know I'm not doing this chronologically, but I feel like this is almost one of the main talking points from the game now. It almost put a slight dampener on it. One of our best performers, again, brilliant performance from him. Um, what do you think we do now in these next three games that he's banned for in terms of the defence? We've seen calls for Adoy to shift across, Hector to come in, Mawson to come in. What would you do if you were in charge? What I would do if I was in charge, I would... I'd whack Mawson in. I'd whack Mawson next to Ream just for yeah. just for three games because we've seen it before and they've done it. But the pattern of which Silver or, or, or how I'm seeing it is Mawson hasn't made the bench for the last two games. Yeah, so Hector's been our, our backup, uh, and obviously with Tete coming back, that actually coincidentally is quite in favour of us now because we've got Tete who can just start right back and we have the option to play a Doy who's done very well in these last few games to play centre back. And it's a position he's played that before and he can do it. And I probably think that that's probably the way to go. I, I just, I know Michael Hector played really well against Blackburn away last time, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. Um, yeah. I mean, Cong I mean, in an ideal world, Congolo slots in, but he's just not ready yet. Um, no, I think he's playing for the under-23s at the time of filming. Exactly. Um, um, but what, I, so I, I agree with you, though, that we should definitely, I, I, I personally adore He's done well at centre back in the past. I think we play a, an out and out centre back for these three games to fill in, and whether that's Mawson or whether that's Hector. And like you say, he seems to be shifting towards Hector at this precise moment in time. Then I think that's what we've got to go with. Hmm. It's a real worry actually because you know we didn't play Tosin against Coventry. Look how that turned out. Yeah. You know we, he's an absolute rock, and I don't really know what he's doing diving in at three 0 up. On Grady D and Garner, I just I, I watched the game back. Uh, I watched about an hour's worth of the game back, just skipping through it last night, and I just watched it back and thought, "There's no need to step out like that. There's no threat. We're three up. It's just a bit. It's just a bit naive and it's just a bit rush of maybe some adrenaline from the performance or the fact we're three nil up. Yeah. Uh, and look, if you're going to go in with your studs up, I mean. A lot of people said it's not a red, but I think I think it probably is, and that's that's a shame. That's three matches now. That's key. Yeah. So I guess it's been covered on YouTube already on the podcast. I don't want to go over the talking points in too much detail from the match, but I'll ask you quick fire. Mm. So the penalty, the red card for West Brom, the non-red card for West Brom, the elbow, and also the red card for Tosin, which you've already answered. I think we both agree that was a red. So the other three, was it a penalty? Was it a red card for Furlong? And was it another red card for that elbow? Was it a penalty? No, not really. And what fear, what now I fear is that either Tosin's red card was sort of the way it balances it out because if it was no penalty, or we're going to get a really bad decision against us. Or... That was the gods giving us the decision because of what Matt Godden did against yeah. Coventry. So I'm, I'm trying to weigh that up in my head. Um, it's not a penalty. Um, although he makes contact with the man in terms of when he goes to uh, get the ball, like his, he shoves him, sort of shoves him or shoulder barges him in some sort, which is maybe why he went down. But the follow through on a doy could have also been a red, but the referee had already a, a pen, but the referee had already blown up. So it's not really a penalty. Andy Hinchcliffe. It was just banging the drum all, all game. Like, we get it. It's, it's not a penalty. You don't have to keep talking about it. Um, the red card on Harry Wilson in terms of the foul from Furlong, because of the position in which the player's in, I'd say I can easily see why that's a red. But the Snodgrass challenge on Robinson is more a red card than Furlong's. And I generally feel like Snodgrass should have been sent off for that. Um so West Brom will feel very hard done by, but I don't think they did enough in the game anyway to, to get anything from it in terms of goals or anything. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I think you're right. I think the decisions favoured us. I, I, I don't think it was a penalty if it wasn't a very, very soft one and one that I'd be annoyed if we conceded because I think it would be quite unfair. So I can appreciate why um, you know West Brom are feeling like that. But the game didn't change, in my opinion, when we went 1-0 up. Um, we were playing the same way. West Brom were playing the same way. We scored from their mistake, so fine, going at half-time 1-0. I know it's not as simple as that, but I think we created enough to win the game. Cabano could have scored. 
Mm. Wilson at the very end, Tosin header before he got sent off. You know, we created the better chances. Um, I think we deserve to win the game. I do think that 3-0 was harsh. I think it was a harsh scoreline. Um, at the same time, I do think we deserve to win fairly convincingly. So um, if I was a West Brom fan, I would be a bit wound up. But I'd also be very wound up at the performance because mm. I, it didn't look like a second versus third game for me. Um, and I really hope that this isn't their equivalent of our Coventry moment when you're well beaten and then you sort of turn a corner um, touch wood hopefully we keep turning that corner or continuing on the path we're on now um, but we're now going to play Blackburn who have got I believe the joint second or even possibly third after Solanke scored top scorer in the league who's still about eight goals behind Mitrovic who's we just talk about him all the time he's just on ridiculous Mental. form Mental. what do you make of this Blackburn game because to me it's a tricky one on paper um, and a game where without Tosin and with this informed strike we're going up against, a little bit nervous about despite our form. I'm really nervous because Blackburn are a team who haven't quite broke into this like playoff contention, but they've still got a lot of talent on the pitch. Um, Berrison Diaz is just scoring goals for fun. He scored a couple of really okay goals against Derby, uh, and they've got good players. Um, uh, Tyrese Dolan, just really good player. Gallagher, very good player for the level. Rothwell, just just players who who are solid. And I see Blackburn as a team who are now progressing um, under um, uh, Tony Mowbray um, as opposed to regressing. I've almost seen like Preston and Blackburn are sort of swap places. Preston looked like the yeah. team that we were going to be the new team that came up from League One a few years ago who were going to break in to the playoffs and get to the Premier League. Now I can see Blackburn Rovers doing it. The problem is with Blackburn Rovers is they're so inconsistent. Yeah, like they have a great day. Uh, they, what was it? They went two up against Luton a, couple, a few weeks ago, and then dropped dropped two points and, and drew two all. Uh, and their home form has been quite good this season. Uh, I think they've lost to West Brom and I think one more. But but they beat like Cardiff like four one or five one. Um, the, the other week during Cardiff's horrendous run. I'm really wary of the game because they've got a lot of talent on show, but I generally feel like you've got the likes of John Mikel Seri and Harrison Reed who can just absolutely control the game or control the ball at least. And and you know, you, you've got Mitrovic who, who basically is scoring goals for fun. I feel like we have enough to win the game. But I'm wary that, you know, midweek without Tosin, Blackburn away, could be cold, could be rainy. Uh, I'm talking from a supporter's view. It could be grim, but... Um, <laughs> I genuinely feel like we should have enough to win, but I, I wouldn't surprise me if it ended in a draw, honestly, Joe. Yeah, I think I think we've got enough firepower to get through it, but it's a game against a team that, as you say, you never really know what you're going to get. Some days they turn up and they're brilliant, like that Cardiff game. Um, and other days they just sort of slump to a bit of a result. Um, I know they beat Derby 2-1 at the weekend, if you watch the highlights of that game. They had to sort of see out a bit of a storm at the end. Derby scored a consolation in the end um, with two or three minutes left of normal time and then had a couple of really big chances to seal it. So they're a team that I think we can 100% get at defensively. It's their attack that worries me because when they click, they're like, honestly, they're one of the, in my opinion, the best attacks in the division. They consistently get goals between them. Gallagher and um, Ben Brereton Diaz in particular and, you know, the latter is in great form, the form of his life, same as Mitrovic. Um, and it is going to be it's going to be a battle. Um, as you say, I just look now, they've only lost one at home in the league. That was to West Brom when That's West cool. Brom were in fine form at the start of the season. So it's going to be a tough one. But I definitely back us to pick up three points in our current form. I feel like if we can pull off wins like that, to be honest, let's face it, the Nottingham Forest and um, West Brom games, 7-0 on aggregate. Um, neither of them at our best then what can we do when we're at our best and hopefully we see that on Wednesday night in terms of the team that we play we obviously saw one change at the weekend Reed came back in for Kearney hmm. um, we're going to have to make at least one change with Tosin out what would you play what would you change would anyone else come back in what would you do well I'd like to see Carvalho start Okay. Um, I know he's not in the best place right now in terms of his contract's not been sorted. So there's a lot hanging over him. There's a lot of fan pressure. 
And I'm sure there's a lot of club pressure for him to sign the contract. But I just feel in these sort of games, you need a little bit of space. And what Carvalho is so good at, and of course we've missed that, is having that space within the half turn to run at defenders. Because yeah. in the last few games, we've had a lot of possession in and around the box, but haven't really had the space to drive forward unless we're on the counter-attack. And of course, Carvalho is fantastic just picking up the ball and just turning and finding a bit of space and maybe going for goal or finding the pass wide or trying to find Mitrovic. On the other hand, nobody deserves to be dropped, apart from Tosin, who's obviously got the red card. Nobody deserves to be dropped. I think Bobby D called over Reed as a 10, interchanging with Wilson, works perfectly. And then you've got the likes of Tom Kearney, who's still trying to get back to fitness. I want to see Carvalho start, but I just don't feel like he's in the right frame of mind. Um, so I wouldn't be I wouldn't be annoyed to see Tom Kearney come back in. Uh, Cabano's got to keep his place. Mitrovic obviously keeps his place. Does Reed come out for Kearney just to give Reed a little bit of a rest because it's a midweek game and he might get another injury and then play Carvalho or Bobby Deagle over Reed in the 10? I actually, this is the first time this season where I don't know what to do in terms of the team and how to adapt. Because right now, because we've got so many of these options coming back, Tete, obviously, Carvalho, suddenly you're like, everyone's playing so well. I don't know who to actually put in. Do you, do you, too many cooks spoil the broth? Do you, do you like, if, you, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, sort of thing? So what, what would you go with? I'm, I'm, I'm fully puzzled. I feel exactly the same in terms of the confusion. There's quite a few different combinations that I'd be happy with in the midfield. I feel like the midfield, even with the toast in red card, is the big sticking point because I personally wouldn't drop Reed. I thought he had a great game and I feel more comfortable defensively when he's in there. Yeah, and he's done better going forward this season as well. So I think Reed and Seri have to start. I don't know if you can drop Bobby after his performance the other day. I thought he was very good. Um but as you say, wouldn't be opposed if Kearney came in. Wouldn't be opposed if Carvalho came in. Um, I think the front three has to stay the same. Cabano, Mitro, Wilson. Um, so for me, it's that question mark, that third midfielder. Um, is it Reed, Kearney or Carvalho? And at the moment, I'd probably just stick with Reed because I don't see why you should drop him after a good performance. So wonderful that we can have those two other options off the bench. Defensively, I agree with you that Hector's clearly fancied him or Mawson, happy with either. Um, wouldn't be, I wouldn't, don't think it would be the end of the world if the Doy played centre back, but I think we've got out and out centre backs. Why not use them? You know, we've got depth in that position. Um, Tete, I'd love to see come back in. I thought a did actually really well physically against West Brom. This is going to be a different test. And I think the best right back at the club is Kenny Tete. Let's play him. There's, there's, I don't think there's any point in not playing him. So, you know, I think that we should be looking at about two changes, possibly three if he wants to change that midfield. But I don't think there's a real need to. I mean, we're blessed with options there. Um, really interesting team selection. I suppose what you could argue is we've got such a big squad. What's the point of it if you're not going to use it when you've got three games in a week and, um, you know, you've got a midweek game and you want people well rested for the game against Peterborough? At the same time, do you change a winning team? It's such a fine balance. So um, there are several lineups I think he could put out and I'd be happy. Mm. I personally would keep the midfield and forward line the same. Hector or Mawson in for Tosin and Tete back at right back would be my team. It's interesting because we made all three changes on Saturday after we scored the third goal. Yeah. So everything was working perfectly. We didn't actually need to change the game because we were mainly in control for the majority of the game. And I just wonder if we were to go a goal down, let's say hypothetically we, we play the same team, apart from obviously someone comes in for Tosin and Tete comes in at right back. Let's say we say this and we go a goal down. I mean, where do you go from there? I would personally bring on Carvalho for a bit of that zip in, in the 10. But this is the I, thing. I, I, th I think I agree, yeah. I, I, I'm so pleased with how things are going right now. I don't want to disrupt it. I don't want to disrupt the continuity. Apart from obviously the fact that Tosin's suspended, which is really, it really is annoying. It does throw a span in the work because, on the one hand, I'm thinking, oh yeah, Mawson just stops in, so I'd rather Mawson comes in, but because he hasn't been on the bench, I'm not, I'm not confident that he's going to play, which is annoying for him and annoying for us because I feel like he's a better centre back than Hector. Yeah, I agree. And from what we've seen of Hector so far this year, I know it's not been much in the cup games. I thought Mawson was more composed. Um, 
Hector was fine. Clean sheets in both games, you know, well done to him. It was more of the distribution that worried me. And that's one of the big things that Tosin brings. Mawson's distribution is better. I know he's left-sided and I'm a big advocate for play them on their correct side. But I think Mawson is a better defender than Hector is. Yeah. And I think I would play him. I don't think Mawson was that terrible against Coventry. I thought the whole team had an awful day. I don't think he was directly responsible for any of the goals. Mm. He was obviously in a unit that didn't play well, but I wouldn't hold that against him. Um, other than that, when he's come in against Hull in the cup games, as I've already said, coming on against Swansea to see out the 3-1 win, he's done well. And I would want him in the team. Um, if not him, then Hector. But I'd probably edge Mawson. Um, he's a weird one, him not being on the bench. Um, and unless he was on the bench against QPR, which I can't remember, then I think that Hector, Hector's been in the last couple of weeks and it's a, it's a bit of a weird one. He must be training really well. And if that's the case, then yeah, maybe give him a shot. But it, it does, as you say, throw a big spanner in the works because that defensive unit has been so competent lately, the most competent it's been all season. I, you would think that Rodak coming in is a big part of that. His Obviously, his um, communication seems a lot better. His handling in the box, his domination of the box seems a lot better, yeah. with no disrespect to Gazaniga. Um, it is going to be interesting to see how we cope with it, because we didn't cope with it well at Coventry. Mm. And of course, um, I can't remember what I was going to say, Marco Silva is uh, is getting the best out of these players. Uh, I, mean, I can't believe we haven't talked about Mitrovic's hat-trick. Let's oh, just talk oh, about yeah. the fact that he's got 18 and 15. It's honestly... And uh, uh, Andy Hinchcliffe again. But I love Andy Hinchcliffe, don't get me wrong, but for this particular game, he did quite annoy me. Yeah. Um, I like watching him when it's not Fulham, basically, because I just like his views, basically. But he basically said it, Mitrovic had probably the easiest hat-trick he'll ever have, which is true. But his last, Mitrovic's last, like, six goals have been tap-in, penalty, and then capitalise on mistake. Capitalise on the mistake at Forest, penalty... And then the one before capitalised the mistake at Cardiff. I mean, that's incredible. But I mean, what, what, in those what couldn't we do last season? We couldn't score those tap-ins. We couldn't score those penalties, mm. famously. Mm. And we never capitalised on the other team's mistakes. And that's why we scored so few goals. And I get that it was a better league. But even the season before, Mitrovic, he's eight goals off his total. Like, unless something drastic happens, he reaches that. You know, an injury, an awful run of form. I, I don't see why people are complaining at the type of goals he's scoring when they are they all count and he wasn't scoring as many as this before. You know, he's in the form of his life. Yes, the service is better this year. That's very obvious. And it's a better attacking team that plays to his strengths. 18 goals at this stage of the season is unbelievable. It's 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 Messi Ronaldo like, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> Mitrovic is nine goals off our whole goals total of last season in the Premier League. Yeah. And he, I think he will get there at some point, whether it will be in the new year. Uh, yeah, it, it, so. The goals could dry up. I was saying to Cam Ramsey before, like, the last game, I said, um, or actually before yesterday's game, uh, Saturday's game, he said, um, Mitrovic could have an off day and he still have a, the games to goal ratio. But now he's got another three. He could have three off games and still have the same game. It's ridiculous. I can't remember who pointed it out, but someone said, might have even been Cam, I'm not sure. If he finished on this total last season, he would have yeah. ended the season as the sixth highest top scorer in the league. That's which is just unbelievable. We're in we're on the first of November. Yeah. This is career mode stuff. <laughs> you know when you yeah. score loads of goals with one player in career mode. And I, like I've I've had I've done it before. But this is this is real life. And the thing is, Mitrovic, who I'm actually going to back to score again. On when on Wednesday night he'll have nineteen and sixteen, or he could have twenty and sixty. You just never know. So so let's let's score predict. What, what's your score prediction? I'm going three one Fulham. I think Mitrovic will score. I think Ben Barrett and Diaz will score, but I think we'll win three one. I also put three one on Super Six, but I was going to say two one today because I just forgot. Yeah. Until you said three one, but I'm actually going to say three one as well. I think <laughs> Mitrovic with one. Seri with another, Ferris and like Diaz back, yeah. and then a third from Harry Wilson. Harry yeah. Wilson from the penalty spot because Mitrovic has already been substituted. Oh, very interesting. 
Very interesting indeed. <laughs> um, anything more you want to? I mean, as you're hosting, so I mean, is, is yeah. there anything anything we want to talk about? I, I, I don't think so. It's just it's it's nice that at the moment, since that Coventry game, we looked at these next four games and before we probably looked at the next five. To be honest, we probably included Blackburn. So it is a tough game. Um, we sort of thought, how many points would we get? I thought we dropped points. I think everyone did. Um, QPR, tough game. Cardiff, yes, not in the best run of form, but the sort of team that we normally struggle against, big, physical, not not the way, not the team we like to play against in terms of the style. Then we've gone to Nottingham Forest, an informed team in the league at the time, and we played third place West Brom. And we've won all of them very convincingly, and it's just brilliant to see. And if we can continue like this then we, we should be going for the title because what I've seen from Bournemouth is if we stay within six points of them, the title's in our hands because I think we're good enough to beat them twice at this moment in time. So Bournemouth fans, please don't come back to this in six months. Um, yeah. I think we're good enough to win the league um, and I saw nothing on Saturday that would change my mind on that. But obviously priority is top two. And if we keep playing like this, we'll get it. That's really exciting to hear. Worth noting, if you haven't seen it already, that uh, Sheffield United at home has now been moved to the Monday, the 20th of December, Monday night on Sky. You can, you can for obvious reasons. Um, it really is Sky Sports Fulham because we're on main event yeah. and Sky Sports Football on Wednesday night as well. Uh, and, and the game against Swansea has been moved from the 1st to the 3rd, which I'm not too sure how to feel about because I was looking forward to a New Year's Eve party in Swansea, but perhaps actually... Just the day trip will do, and that saves a bit of uh, saves a bit of money. But wow, Fulham uh, four points clear. So even if we do lose on Wednesday, which hopefully we do not, we're still in second place regardless of what happens. Because West Brom have got some favourable fixtures coming up. They're playing Hull, who are on dreadful run of form. Yeah. Uh, I think they've got Middlesbrough coming up, and yeah, yeah, someone like that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. just need to stay second. <laughs> just need to stay second. We've got a nice. We've not got a nice cushion now. Um, just need to hope that this run of games without Tosin, we don't we don't lose that gap. Mm. Norwich have scored three goals this season. We Mitrovic has scored six times that as much. I know it's a different league, um, but well, Norwich really, I don't know what to say really. Um, it, it's quite comforting to see a team who are worse than what we were back in eighteen nineteen and, and last season as well, but. Uh, Let's just call it a day and we'll see you back on, well, Monday. We've got two games from now. So, I mean, it's hard to ask for a score prediction for Peterborough yeah. when circumstances will be different. What I will say is that I am glad that Totin's missing the likes of Peterborough and Barnsley. Obviously, Blackburn's a bit of a difficult one. But if I did have to choose you know, three opponents for him not to play games, you know, Peterborough and Barnsley would probably be top of the list, which is good. Yeah, no disrespect to them, but you know you want him to play against the weakest teams in the division. Peterborough's defence is one of the worst in England, possibly the worst this mm. season. Barnsley sacked the manager today, but they've been in a dreadful run of form. And if it wasn't for Derby's points deduction, they would be bottom of the league. So I mm. uh, completely agree with what you're saying. And it's no disrespect to those teams. You obviously don't want them to be playing the best attacks. Um, and hopefully Michael Hector's wearing his magic hat. And we throw yes. it back to the one nil win when you were just floating in the away end. Yes. Um, and we can see out another clean sheet, which would be the fourth in a row, I think. Yeah, that would be very impressive. I think the clean sheet is is what I was hoping for most when it was at three nil. Um, what's interesting about Blackburn away is both times I've been there, we've won one nil and we've yeah. been in the lower tier and then we've been in the upper tier and it now looks like we're going to be back in the lower tiers. So I don't really know what's going on there with the away end, yeah. but uh, it's going to be good fun. There's not going to be many Fulham fans, fans up there, I can assure you, but um, it's live on Sky, so you know, you've know you got a nice comfy sofa to watch it on, whereas I've got a, a cold, freezing Ewood Park <laughs> and maybe a chicken bolty pie to, for some <laughs> kind of lucky, comfort. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Right, um, we should call it a day then, and uh, we'll see you back on Monday, hopefully when we've got six more points on the table, and let's hope a little bit more wiggle room in those top two places. Come on, Fulham. And we'll see you Monday. Enjoy Blackburn away if you're going or watching on TV. And enjoy Peterborough where we have sold out our allocation. Joe, thanks very much for being here. Thanks a lot, Jack. Enjoy Blackburn. Oh, come on. It's going to be great if we win. Let's go, Fulham. Mm -hmm.